This is 11. My brother has a dog, puppy named 11. 11. Uh, well, you can do that to actually help people, puppies learn the name. I think he already has it. Don't tell the other 11, I think you're cuter. All right, so in this video, I'm gonna do kind of a medley of a lot of little things for puppies. Um, now, first thing, I wanna make sure the puppies get 11 into a puppy socialization class. We're gonna send uh, all the emails that we sent out to the people in our classes. Unfortunately, our class is about 1,800 miles away. Sit. Um, and, uh, but, but they learn more in, an, in a, an hour of playing with other puppies than they do in a month's worth of formal training with humans. So it's really important you get them to develop social skills, how to learn to invite other puppies to play, not to, to say I don't want to play. And so it should be other puppies, not too many. They should be, usually they're, they're done by breed size. We do at least. And so you don't want him in with like tiny little Pomeranians or Chihuahuas because he's gonna play too rough for them and the Guardians are gonna resent it. So you wanna find a class that's not too big, but six to 12 dog puppies, they're all around his same age. All right, now um, I talked a little bit about uh, sit. Sit. Remember I tell you to give a treat, the treats go in the mouth first and they should hear the command word after the treat goes in the mouth. Not just for puppyhood, for the rest of their life. Um, so I talked, to him, because he's only 11 weeks now, 11, um, we want to get him working on his critical socialization. Uh, they go through a period where uh, from three weeks to 14 weeks where anything they're supposed to once or twice is called a single exposure period. If it's done in a good way, they're like, oh, that was a Harley Davidson. That was a line. That was a skateboard or whatever it is. And if they weren't around, the rest of their life, they're like, what the hell was that thing? And so I would recommend you download the checklist. Um, I think I sent uh, you guys already a link to it. If not, just message me, I'll send it to you. Uh, but basically, uh, it's a list of 344 items. Download it as an Excel checklist, and then basically put a value of one, two, or three. Ones are things your puppy's gonna be around a lot for the rest of its life. Threes are things it's probably not gonna be around. Sit. I work in TV, so I have my dog go to a TV studio. That's probably a number three for you guys. Uh, but construction sites, probably something, you know, that'd be higher up on construction sounds. So he's comfortable with those, and that way he can take him to work if you need to. Sit. Okay, so that's really what you want to work on until he's 14 weeks. I would, I would say that supersedes everything other than going to a puppy class. Puppy class is a one-week class. Uh, normally, and now for here, I'm just freezing because uh, he just wants my attention. Now, I can also redirect his attention. And a lot of having puppies is redirecting their attention to something else. So let's talk about uh, mouthing and chewing, so that's kind of what he was just doing. So I redirected him. Well, first thing I do, and I'm gonna make the sound. Let me play with you a little. And remember, growling, some puppies growl when they play. It doesn't mean they're aggressive. And some puppies, uh, uh, a growl should never be, uh, what I was waiting for. Puppy should, uh, an adult dog should never be punished for growling. A growl is a communication. I don't like what's going on. I disagree. If you punish them, they'll just go straight to a bite. And I've had a lot of clients where that's the case. All right, while we're doing this, I'm going to show you how to teach him to drop. So he's got something in his mouth. We hold the treat in front of his mouth. We're not giving him any commands. Drop. And then he gets his original stuff back. You want to practice that a lot. So when he has any of his toys and he's got them in his mouth, now he's holding it, just quietly pull out a treat. Drop. And then he gets his original stuff back. That way later on when he does take stuff that you don't want him to have, it's pretty easy to get him to drop. Um, okay, so if he does uh, bite you or is too mouthy, does he have a little something on his eye? Yeah. Okay. So uh, just keep an eye out if it grows, have your vet take care of it. But basically, anytime he touches you with his teeth, if it's accidental, you want to yelp like I did earlier, like a little girl who gets scared or something. So, and then you retract and you freeze. So I do, I have a couple different things I do. So the first thing I do is as soon as he touches, he bites, mouths, or just accidentally, I'm giving him the, ah! and then I would go back to playing with him. So that's the first stage. The second one is I would carry around a nylabone, a nylabone that looks like a bone that actually no bones really look like. Make sure it's rigid, should not have any bend or flexibility to it. Always have one in your pocket at all times. So if I yelp and he does, it doesn't respond, he keeps on going back, then I pull it out. Now if I just give it to him, he's not gonna be interested in it. So I'll use this to simulate it. So if I just give it to him, he's not gonna, well, as a puppy, he probably will be, but eventually he won't. So what I would do is I kind of tease him here, tease him here. Now he's already got something in his mouth, but if he didn't, he would just, at this point start biting at it and then I'd let him pull up, grab it, and then I'd let him pull it away from me. Now I've redirected him towards this and he's gonna go take his trophy and go chew on it. Uh, now the third thing uh, that we do is, uh, if a dog gets really aggressive when you're doing those things, sit, chill, 
passive training we'll talk about that in a sec. But if your puppy gets really aggressive with these things, usually it means they need a nap. Puppies sleep close to 20 hours a day. And when they don't get enough sleep, they get really tired and cranky and overly bitey and aggressive bitey is often always an indication of that. So ask yourself, has it been too long for him? If it is, then probably took some time for him to be here by himself or in the kennel. I would recommend just having him here by himself. So if he gets, keeps on jumping up and biting your legs and you've tried the other two things that are not working, I would just kind of step over this and go upstairs and just leave him by himself. He's gonna protest for a minute or two, but make sure you have a plethora of other amazing great toys to chew on. Um, we can talk about that now. That's like the perfect pose for you to, now that I don't have my camera, I can't take a picture. He's like sitting with his legs crossed. Uh, so basically, uh, for toys, we want a, a variety of toys. This is a tug toy. And so, uh, and the Guardian asked about, play, uh, about playing tug of war. And the vet said, no, never do that. I love playing tug of war with puppies because it gives us the ability to engage with them. And if they accidentally touch us with their teeth, we drop it and we stop playing. That's a form of operant conditioning. So we're saying, as soon as you touch me with the teeth, we stop playing. Well, dogs went through repetition, consistency, and good time. You have about three seconds, actually about 45 seconds, but the chart goes like this. One second, two second, three second, four, five, six, seven, almost goes straight down. So after about three seconds, it's really easy for something else to be associated. So really you want to focus on that three second window. So basically, if you're playing tug of war and uh, he touches you the teeth, you just drop it and then the game is over. Um, and after a while, he'll learn to be much more careful and selective about their mouth, and they are very precise with it when they want to be. Um, and teaching bite inhibition is one of the most important things for any breed of dog. When we have pit bulls, a, bull, uh, a breed that a lot of people are, are very misinformed about, they are no more likely to be aggressive than any other breed of dog. It actually used to be called the nanny dog. They would leave them with newborns because they're so docile. That's why they're abused so much, is because when people should cut the ear off, so they'd be a matter of fighting the dog. It's like, I'm so sorry my ear was in your razor's way. And so unfortunately they get abused, but they're great loyal dogs and he's got a great personality. So um, teaching him to drop, because he is gonna get some stuff you don't want and, be, and having a strong drop command is very beneficial. But they're natural gonna explore things with their mouth and they like chewing on things when they're bored. So giving him like 20 to 30 appropriate chew toys is gonna really help. That way you always have something nearby that you can redirect him into chewing on. Now, um, I'm not a fan of using raw hides because they're soaked in formaldehyde, bleach, ammonia, a lot of other nasty chemicals. I gave him a, a bully stick or a bully bite from the Natural Dog Company. It's the Natural Dog Company. Um, they're odor free and I recommend having a bag of those so you always have one. Now the drop, usually we let him drop and then he gets his original stuff back. But if he does have something he's not allowed to have, when he drops it, before, before you take something away, you want to give him something of equal or greater value. So having a couple bully sticks around in, in reserve is really helpful. Also for the toys, if you go to uh, doggoneproblems.com, click on where it says Quest Ed, and just page through, there's only four pages of stuff, but look for a picture of a little Dalmatian with a whole bunch of toys lined up behind him on the floor. I kind of go, I have a whole post about toys. I would recommend going to Amazon, spend about a hundred bucks, get some rope toys, some tug toys, a couple plushies. I would get him a couple antlers. I would get him a water buffalo horn, a couple real bones. Um, and uh, you know a couple balls and different things. If you get them used to it as a puppy is playing with things, a lot of times the rest of their life they will. If you don't, the rest of their life they won't know how to play with those. So, um, and giving him an appropriate amount of appropriate chew things will limit him chewing on other things. Now I usually like to have about 30, 20 out at any one point and 10 in reserve. And then each day I take one of these out, I put it at the beginning of the box that's in the closet and I grab something from the end of the box and put them back in circulation. It'll make your toys last a little bit longer and he's more engaged with them. We also talked a little bit about the clicker, what we'll talk about here in a minute, and potty training. The guardian, one of the guardians is using this, for, and this is a wonderful tool, it makes things easier. I would not use it for potty training. So what I would do for potty training, the three times a puppy is most likely to go is right after waking up, five minutes after eating, and 15 minutes after the start of heavy play. So he gets to zoom in, he starts running around, look at your clock. 10, 15 minutes later, take him outside. Now you guys have a door that's open, so he's going out on his own a lot, which is great. Um, we're not doing the two major mistakes people make, which is rub the dog's nose in or verbally chastising the dog. Those will make it harder. So what you want to do is every time he goes outside, don't tell him to potty. Just wait. Yeah, that's going to give you a little passive training, but we'll, we'll get to that in a sec. So take him outside, uh, or don't take him outside, just walk outside when he goes out there. And just if he goes out on his own, just wait. As soon as, and resist the temptation to tell him potty, potty, potty. Don't ever repeat a command word. That'll teach them to learn, uh, to learn relevance. They'll stop listening for it. So just we'll follow him outside. 
and give, and if he doesn't go in five minutes, it's not urgent enough for him to go. You guys just set up as the doors open all the time. This is his area. So I think he's, you're going to be ahead of the curve with this. But if you do go to somebody else's house or a place where you have to take him outside, uh, those are three times to take him. And give him out five minutes. If he doesn't go in five minutes, it's not urgent enough to go. He's distracted and he's forgotten he needs to go. So, well, let's say he starts peeing or pooping. As soon as he starts peeing or pooping, come up with a command word for potty. You can say potty, but because dogs read facial expression, I am a huge supporter of coming up with funny command words. It motivates your dog to do that activity for the rest of its life because it, the dog is the only animal on the planet that can read a human facial expression. So that's gonna make the dog smile and, uh, or happy because it made everybody else happy and it makes it want to repeat that action or behavior. So uh, I say business, some of my clients in puppy class say like dump or splat or plop or whatever you wanna say. So let's say we're just gonna say uh, uh, business. So we take, go outside when he goes outside and we just observe. When he starts to pee or poop, within three seconds of him starting, we say the word business in a normal tone of voice. If you say it too excited, that'll often stop him from going. Same word for peeing, same word for pooping. Just one word for both. So as soon as he starts peeing, you say business. When he gets down, you crouch down like a softball catcher. The crouching down will almost always attract the dog. When he comes to you, have a treat out extending in front of you. Put the treat in his mouth. And remember, always the treat goes in the mouth first, and then they hear the command word and say the word potty. Not good potty, not such a smart dog. 11, just potty. And also be careful of your inflection. They do hear inflection. There's a difference between potty and potty. So always say it the same way. So um, after a while, then he's like, I dare not waste this urine inside. If I do it outside, I get a, I get a reward. Now the guardians also have, I've never seen one of these things, but they're uh, working on training the dog to, be, to ring a bell. Now I never use a clicker for potty training unless I'm trying to train like a Pomeranian or something that's only gonna pee for one second. He's gonna pee plenty long, so I would just mark it verbally. Um, and if you ever wanna check if your dog has a verbal command, now potty's a little bit different because sometimes just doesn't have to go. But you wanna, if the dog, you think your dog knows how, what sit is, if you saw sitting where the pet robot is, I would turn my head away so he can't see it and say sit without any gestures. If he sits down, then that means he has a verbal gesture. Most dogs learn from emotion first, then they learn the gesture later, which is why I say it twice. So if he comes to, if he was here, I'd say sit to tell him what to do if he knows the command. If he doesn't, I would just use passive training, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. But let's say he knows the command. I say sit, when he sits, I pet him under his chin and I say sit again. So I say sit during the command stage to tell him what to do. When he obliges, then I reward him by petting him under his chin and say the word again to put it in context. Uh, well, the first time I put it, uh, yeah, to put it in context. So um, uh, petting a dog under the chin facilitates the nose up. The body mechanic of a proud dog is to have its nose in the air. So try to get in the habit of petting under his chin. You can pet him anywhere in his body you want, but I would avoid petting him on top of the head because that can create a cowering or head down body mechanic. And insecure dogs are the ones that are most likely to get into trouble. Okay, um, so uh, the, the guardians here have a, like a, a machine that makes a bell sound, and it's on the door. The problem with that is we have to put it into context for a dog to understand. Uh, they learn through repetition, consistency, and good timing. So what we want to do is, when the, uh, I would first focus on getting a verbal command. So if you're on a park or somewhere where you don't have the bell, he, he can, you can verbally cue and say uh, business or potty or whatever the word is. Once you can say potty and he goes like this, you know, and he runs outside to potty, then you know he's got that command. At that point, if you want to ring the bell, what I would do is take the bell outside with you and wait, and as soon as he starts to pee or poop, start ringing that bell, the automatic bell in this case, and only while he's peeing or pooping. So as soon as he gets in, stop ringing it. Then crouch down, he'll come to you, pop the treat in his mouth, and then start ringing the bell again. And then as soon as he gets done chewing it, stop ringing the bell. So the first time associates the ringing of the bell with the action of elimination. Second time associates the, the uh, reward with the bell sound. And after a while, they become conflated. So that's potty training. Um, let me see. Uh, I went through the yelping and the three steps, right? Uh, on the video or before? I can't. I don't remember doing it on the video. So I'm I don't think you went all the way through it. I did. Okay. You didn't. Oh, I did. Okay. Yeah. So the first thing I do is I yelp one time like a little girl, and I retract. Second time, I pull out the bully stick and I tease him, or, or the, I think I did, but we'll go through it, just to make sure, the, the uh, nylabone. And you should have a whole bunch of nylabones in different sizes and shapes, but these are the ones you want to have like two, about four of these that are the rigid bone looking ones that always have one in your pocket. So if he starts chewing on you, pull it out and tap him on the, this side of his head, he turns this way, tap him on this side. So you kind of tease him with it until he latches onto it and let him pull it a couple times. When he pulls it and runs away, then he's going to go chew on it. The third thing is the sleep. So yeah, I think I'm pretty sure we did, but 
better safe than sorry. Now also, I like to use baby carrots. Carrots ward off a type of cancer in dogs, and it's a great way to redirect him in chewing something appropriate. If he's licking the leg of the chair, he's licking it to get it soft, and then he's going to start chewing it soon. So instead of chastising it, which makes it the forbidden fruit, what I would do is silently get up, go to the fridge, take about four or five carrots out, and if I'm the dog, I'll plant them on it. Say I'm here licking the stool here. I'm gonna have the human wrap over here. This dog will look here. Drop the carrots from a couple of inches. Dogs' uh, eyes are very attractive, for, uh, very programmed for movement. They're not very good for detail or for color. So if you drop them for about four inches, that's gonna make him naturally want to come over. And he's gonna turn this way and lay down and chew these carrots. When he gets done, he's looking in this direction. He's not looking at the chair leg. So you effectively have redirected him. The reason I like using carrots is, well, first of all, they ward off a type of cancer. They're good things for dogs to chew on. But once he turns about four and a half to five months, he's gonna start losing his baby teeth and his adult teeth are gonna come in and he's gonna start chewing on stuff to soothe his gums. At that point, I take the baby carrots and I put them in the freezer and then I pull out a handful of those, I rinse the hard frost off and give it to him, and that can numb his gums. Okay, um, so uh, I'm trying to think what uh, other things we want to go over. I want to teach you how some, uh, some basic commands. So let's go over uh, sit down, up, and stand. Now, uh, I, the guardian may want to change it, but I recommend fun command words. And he said uh, chill for lay down. So first of all, I'm going to show him that I have... Well, actually, let's go over a, a recall since he's far away. I call this the bit the science of the hand. When I, before I call the dog, I'm holding my hand with a 90 degree bend here. I'm only holding it toward, I would normally point it towards the dog. I'm holding it this way so you see a 90 degree. I want my forearm parallel with the floor going up or down. The more uh, lower it goes, the more it's for the dog. The higher it goes, the less it's for the dog. If I want the dog to sit, I raise it in an arc over his head. As soon as, and that will cause their butt to go down. As soon as the butt goes down, I lower it, let him lick it off, and then I tickle him under the chin. I'm gonna show you how to do it right here. Now, he doesn't know probably what come is this point, so I'm going to use his name. So, 11! I start lowering it. That causes him to come to me. When I want him to get to where I want, I raise it an arc over his head to put him into a sit. Always go back to the nose if he's not engaged. I'm using the fingertip. There we go. Come. I could have said come or drop there, but come is what we wanted to go over. So, before you ever call him... Hold your hand out like this and have a treat in it. Come, and then tickle him under his chin. So I would have you guys practice this. When you practice come, uh, you want to have at least three people. If it's only two, you just pogo back and forth. So you want to have everybody about seven feet apart, and one person's in charge, so you don't have two people call them at the same time. So I'm in charge. I say to the guardian, your turn, and you hold out your hand like this first. Say, 11! Lower it. Raise it up. Come. We're not saying come to begin with because he doesn't know what it means yet. So we're saying it in context. He just came to us and then we say the word come. And I expect a dog to come and sit. If he didn't, sometimes I would give him a treat for not sitting, but he knows how to do that, no problem. All right, 11, let's do some, uh, some basic commands. I'm going to try this. Yes, I got a whole bunch of good treats here. Let's get a drop. Drop. We'll put that back there for now. Now I'm going to do up, sit down, up, and stand. I'm going to have more treats than I actually need, and I like having the treats in my hand. And again, have more, two or three more, because a lot of times you have to re repeat a command over and over again. Let's put you on the left over here, so we have better camera presence. Sit, sit. So as soon as his butt hits the ground, I put the treat in his mouth and say sit. Now I have another one right away, and I'm catching his nose, and I'm literally going straight down. And if he bends like, if he gets up, I bend my elbows to say that's not what I want. Go back to his nose and go straight down. Sometimes I'll zigzag it like this, sometimes I'll push and pull. And let's see, if, there we go. That sweeping caught a little distraction. There we go. Now I'm gonna use the clicker for this. I'm gonna talk about the clicker when we're done with this. I should have done it in the other order. Oh. I'm not gonna give him another one for SIT because he knows what that one is. There we go. And pawing at it is normal. Uh, speaking of pawing, I would not recommend teaching him to lay down, uh, to uh, shake. Chill. I didn't use the clicker for that one. I'll do it for this one. So I'm gonna get the next one is to sit up. I call it up instead of S-I-T, up. And then I hold a flat hand, stand. So the clickers indicate the precise second you did what I wanted, and we're gonna get a treat in your mouth as fast as we possibly can. Now, if you wanna use a clicker, first thing you have to do is create a classically conditioned response, which the guardian is gonna like as she works in psychology. So basically, this is, uh, this is uh, Pavlov. 
So to, to prime the clicker, we call it, we throw a treat on the ground. So what you want to do is about 10 to 12 treats. You throw them on the ground one time, you click the second he, clicks it, he licks it up. The thing you never do is, it's not a remote control, so don't use it to get the dog's attention, sit. Now I wouldn't use it for potty training, you could, but I really probably wouldn't. So uh, what I would do is, as soon as the dog does what I want, so right here, I'm not gonna give him the command, I'm, this is operate condition, this is the other way the dogs learn, this is, uh, I was gonna say Skinner, I was waiting to see what you were gonna do. So I'm just waiting, this is called free shaping, where you're not giving the dog any commands, you have the clicker to indicate when he did what you want, so the instant he SITs, I'm gonna click and then I'm gonna give him the treat. Now, this is one where you have to have a lot of patience because you see he's a puppy, he's gonna lose his interest and do what he wants to do. He's, gonna, he's a smart puppy, he went straight to the treat pouch, which you should probably get, it makes it a little easier. All right, let's go with luring. So, anytime you're luring, try to keep the treat within an inch of his nose. And if he loses track, go back to his nose. I'm not pushing, sit. So you click when his butt hit the ground and then you get a treat in his mouth as soon as you can and then you say the command word afterwards. I'm not telling him to sit. I think he actually knows sit, but a lot of times we say sit, 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 sit. Not like that, but sit, sit. 11, sit. 11, sit down. 11, sit. What's your problem? Why are you not sitting? Because I have a puppy and I don't know what sit means quite yet. So if I repeat it a whole bunch, there's something called learned irrelevance, a dog will stop listening for that. So say it once or twice, and then use a hand gesture if you need to. If you don't, then that just means that you need to practice whatever that activity is. So as you're coming back here, you're gonna stand on my butt. All right, um, let me think, what else? Um, <laughs> sit. Playing, um, all right, let's see what else we can do. Now, if he jumps up at me like this, anything your dog is doing when you pet it is what you are specifically amplifying or rewarding. If I petted him when he did that, I'm telling him jumping up on a human is a great way to, to get attention from me. What is cute at this size, I promise you will not be as cute at that size. So there's nothing wrong with him jumping up on you if you invite him up, but if he does it on his own and we pet him, we're rewarding him for doing just that. I'm gonna pull it back here, buddy. There we go. Uh, whoops. <laughs> so if you come home and your dog's excited and you pet it, you can make it more excited. If it's fearful and you pet it, you can make it more fearful. This is probably the most common mistake people make with dogs. When it comes back around, I'll show you. But if you have a dog that's fearful, instead of petting him uh, to reward that fearfulness, which we don't, I can lay my hand on him. Dogs do associate touch with affection. But as soon as you start petting him, you're going to make it worse. Now, um, Trying to think what else we want to go over in this one. Yes. Oh, we went over a little bit of the beginning of the heel. Kisses. Oh, passive training. Passive training is just waiting for a dog to organically offer you the behavior that you want. Um, so basically, every time he comes to you, pet him and say the word come. If you have a clicker, you can click and then pet him. But you probably don't have this with you all the time. That's okay. Every time that you want that bully stick bad, don't you? Um, every time that he sits down near you, pet him and say sit. Every time he lays down, pet him and say crash. Name all your individual toys. All balls can be balls, all bones can be bones. Let me call this one Tony for Tony the Tiger. I think you're actually, uh, he's a moose. I'm not sure what he is. But you know, you know call him you know, Orange, Mr. Orange, or whatever you want to call it. So coming up with these vocabulary words can be really beneficial. Um, I would recommend for the next two months that you feed him exclusively out of treat dispensing toys, not a Kong. Kongs are great, but the food will just come out right away. I would want you to, the one that I like the most is an Omega Treat Ball. You can get those on Amazon or Chewy. Let's not chew on my shoelaces, buddy. Um, and so an Omega Treat Ball is a ball about, and get the bit large one. It's gonna be about the size of a softball. It has a little hole and a sleeve in it. You put this food in, he's gotta nudge it just right for a couple pieces of kibble to come out. My dog's like a little soccer player nudging this thing around the room. I set up a long-term confinement area like you have here, and I fed him out of one of those things for every meal until he was five months old. At five months old, I could leave him unsupervised in my house. He is never chewing there. He's three years old now. So I have another one that's a star with like three trays. He has to move the star just right, and there's a little tray underneath it where he can, uh, where he can uh, get the stuff. Now, if he's chewing on something you don't want, what I do is I put my finger in the corner of his mouth to pull him away, and then I take away the temptation. Uh, yes, you want the bully stick, don't you? I'll hold it right here so you, got, you stay in the shot. Um, so basically, um, uh, I'm trying to think, what was I just talking about before that? 
Um, I don't know. My mind is a crazy thing. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Yes, you pulled it away. And that's what he wants. He wants to play tug of war. Um, and tug of war, like I said, is fine. Um, so, oh, passive training and petting with purpose. So passive training is, like I said, just rewarding. Sit. That's passive training right there. I didn't ask him to sit, but when he sat, I rewarded him. Chill. And come up with those fun command words because dogs can read facial expression. So I usually use a vocabulary as a watchword. So if somebody comes to the room and says, I'm saying, come here, come here. They're like, say vocabulary. I'm like, here, come here is not the word. The command is come. So then I would say thank you and I would say come. I say come first and I thank the person. Using one word commands can accelerate their learning up to 82%. And only using that word, not good come, not the dog's name, just the word come, sit, crash, whatever they are. So come up with a list of the official command words, take them in the refrigerator or somewhere. And if somebody's using a different version of it, say, you know, vocabulary, that person needs to go to the official word. I also say repeat or rerun if somebody's using the same word over and over again, because that's gonna train the dog to ignore it. Um, and then eventually I want you to do something called petting with a purpose. This is probably, this is like almost the foundation of everything that I do. It's not, but it's, it's in the ballpark. So petting with a purpose, if the dog comes up and jumps up on you or nudges you, well, I think I remember what I was talking about earlier, was being excited. So if he's excited and we pet him when he's jumping up or when he's excited, we're gonna reward him for jumping up or for being excited, he's gonna continue doing those things. So when you come home, if he's excited, I want you just, and he jumps, if he jumps up on you, I want you to freeze and cross your arms and look up and just become boring. Now, if he's pulling, he's gonna tear some fabric or something like that, you might put your finger in the corner of his mouth to get him disengaged, and then I would immediately step over the boundary. That probably means he's overly tired and cranky. Um, so that's a, uh, but just freezing become boring is a form of operant conditioning. Well, it's not, but it's in the family. So basically, when he jumps up, it causes you to freeze, which is operant conditioning. And when he gets down, give him a stopgap measure, ask him to sit or lay down or do something else, and then reward him for doing that. If he gets down, you pet him and say off, well, he's just gonna jump up on to get the off. So it's important that we kind of put things in context for them. But petting with a purpose is, is this really, really easy way to train your dog that will re increase its respect for you, boost its self-esteem, and help it practice. So for uh, petting with a purpose, if he comes up and nudges you or paws at you or barks at you for attention, he's giving you an order. And he's super cute, but he's still telling you what to do. And if you do it, that after a while, that can convince him into thinking that he has the same rank or authority, or maybe even more rank than you do, because when he tells you what to do, you do it. So instead, if he nudges you or punches you with his nose or paws at you, give him a counter order once he knows them. Tell him to sit or to chill, lay down. Those are more subordinate body postures for dogs. It's hard to look really authoritative when you're sitting or laying down. So helping a dog practice doing those things, I almost equated to saying please or thank you to sit or lay down. So if he comes up and nudges me, I don't do anything. Because if I do something, I'm telling him he's in charge. After a while, he realizes when I tell the humans what to do, nothing happens. But if the humans tell me what to do and I do it, I get a reward, I get hooked up. After a while, the dog starts realizing, I can't tell them what to do, I have to ask. And better than ask, I have to actually pay for it, the privilege of their attention, and I pay for it through a currency of obedience. So what will happen is the dog will start coming and sitting in front of you to prepay for attention. When it does that, pat it under its chin, say the word sit, and only the word sit, and then pet it as much or as little as you want. If he doesn't sit, Playing hard to get works wonderful for dogs. So if he doesn't sit the first time you say it, within three seconds, pull out the paper, read some emails, if he grumps up on you, or then just step over the deal and step out of his reach and show him, I have other things to do. I, as a matter of fact, I have 38 things I can be doing right now. I made you number one because you're so cute and I love you and I want to pet you, but if you can't be bothered to sit, I can't be bothered to pet you. Leaders tell people what to do, followers ask. So if he learns to start coming up to you and sitting down to prepay for that attention, like I said, it's called manding or learning to man, and he's learned I can influence the human's behavior by doing something good. Or I can influence their behavior by doing something bad. I think he's gonna go poop. Uh, his butthole is kind of puckering a little bit. So um, if he comes and jumps up on me, I freeze. So that operant conditioning tells him that jumping up the humans causes them to become boring. That's the opposite of what I want. I want them to play with me. But every time I sit in front of them, they start petting me like crazy. So that's why he'll start coming and sitting in front of you to prepay for that attention. When he does that, make sure you recognize that. Otherwise, he'll go back to jumping up. Now, I have explained that, yep, I was, I love it when I'm right. Long, long skinny poop. All right. Um, so, um, 
I explained this to a woman in Santa Monica, and she's got a little Bichon or a little, I don't know where she had, a little tiny white dog. And she's petting her dog. She goes, well, I have a question for you about this. And I go, okay, I'm going to ask you to stop petting your dog before you ask me that question. She said, okay. But, you know, why? I got a puppy, because I, a dog, because I like petting them. They make me feel good to pet dogs. I'm like, you're petting your dog again. Well, I'm sorry. That's all right. Hold off on petting your dog till we've done this. She goes, okay. But I also have hypertension, and I was told that petting a dog can actually lower my blood pressure. Come. I can't pet you for jumping up though. So, uh, so and, and as she says the hypertension thing, she starts reaching over petting her dog again. And I point out she's petting her dog again, so she stops. Three times in the course of 15 seconds of me asking her not to pet her dog, but most importantly of her intending not to pet her dog, she involuntarily reached over to pet her dog. Now, like I said earlier, anything your dog is doing when you pet it is what you're reinforcing. Now right here, I'm petting him for really doing nothing. That's okay. But if you, uh, to answer her question, I would still say that you should sit, that's passive training, uh, but you should still ask the dog to do something to earn it. This boosts the dog's confidence because it's earning that attention versus being given that attention. Number two, it increases the dog's respect for you as an authority figure because instead of telling you what to do, it's asking, matter of fact, prepaying. Number three, it helps them practice sit, which for some reason it comes to dogs, we try to train them in the moment. We have a house full of people and we try to teach them not to jump up on people. We would never accept that for ourselves. We, if I'm gonna learn something, I'm gonna learn in a classroom environment. Somebody says, show me how to do it, I'm gonna try it my own way because I'm an arrogant SOB and then I'm gonna realize that it doesn't work and then try it the teacher's way, and it works. But I realized I came to that conclusion on my own. And I'm practicing in a, in a classroom environment so there's no pressure on my shoulders. Learning to drive on the 405 freeway at five o'clock traffic on Memorial Day weekend is the worst place to learn to drive. The pressure is gonna cause you to make an accident. So for puppies, instead of doing that, we wanna teach them that doing the right thing is what's, uh, and, and setting it up in a situation where I'm not entertaining guests. I'm not worried about the dog getting any food or whatever it is, I can just focus on it. As a dog behaviorist, what I try to do is put the dog in a position where it can only do a couple things because I've created an environment where I've controlled things. And so the dog has an option to do three things. Two of them are things I don't want, one of them is the thing I want. If he does the thing I want, I richly reward him and I mark it by saying the command word. If he does the other two things, nothing happens. Dogs, come. Dogs don't need to be punished. Matter of fact, dogs don't learn very well from being punished. Luckily, these guardians know that, so you're in a good, pay, good place, buddy. Um, but a lot of us, we take things personally when dogs do things like, he chewed that shoe up on purpose. They peed in the house on purpose. They are not that sophisticated thinkers. They just needed to go and they forgot to go outside, or they missed you so much they chewed on your shoes because they smell and taste like you. So um, uh, the more that we reward the dog for the behaviors that we want, the more likely that we do them. For dogs, good attention and bad attention is pretty much the same thing. So if the dog chews the carpet and I go over there and ch chastise the dog, well, that's the best way to ch ch page my humans. <laughs> but if the dog comes to me and I pet it and say, come, if it sits in front of me, I pet it and say, sit, I lay down, I pet it and say, chill. After a while, that's what the dog's gonna start doing is the things that get your attention. And uh, once you get in the habit of doing that, now your dog and you have the same motivation. Come, that's passive training right there. If he kisses you, kisses. So every time he kisses you, kind of say kisses. Now he's jumping up, so we're mixing our poisons a little bit. Yes, are we? All right, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else we want to go over. Um, is there anything else you want me to go over that we, uh, oh, before you feed him, make sure that you eat something first. In the what, uh, this probably means I need a nap. We've been at this for about three hours now. Uh, so I'm just becoming boring. I'm not engaging with him and we should see him find something else to do. There we go. Um, so um, the socialization uh, is really what, the, the critical socialization checklist you need to worry about and then socialization at this stage. Now, uh, for your shots, uh, try not to give them, you have a good vet. Why do you want to eat for? Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Yeah. Um, so dogs eat in the order of their rank. They spend 90% of their time in the wild looking for food. When they do kill or capture, they eat in the order of their rank. So if you don't eat in front of the dog, it's like, why would I listen to you? You don't even have eating privileges. You don't have to eat a real meal, just get a chip or cracker, eat in five bites, then put down the Omega treat ball and let him go and eat that. Um, uh, uh, uh. There we go, thank you. Yes. So at this point, I'm pretty sure he's cranky. He's getting really mouthy, and this is just what they do when they get overly mouthy. So what we would do at this point is just step up and go upstairs or go over there. I haven't been to the rest of the house, but go somewhere else and leave him alone. Now, if he's if he is barking and growling, 
and crying, and I come back while he's growling, and humping is not always sexual. This is kind of a, a dominance wrestling sort of thing. I'm just not gonna engage with it. Um, if he does hump you, that's a different story. Um, you're scratching my nails. Oh, speaking of nails, um, I thought I remember. All right, so um, we don't have the Dremel here, but uh, something that's really important for puppies is that we look under their tail, we look in their ears, we check out their, their, their teeth, and we get them used to us manipulating their digits. These are things that cause them a lot of problems later in life. The nails, if the nails get too long, sometimes they splinter down the middle and you actually have to amputate the nail. I've seen several clients where that's the case. If you keep them nice and short, the chances of that happening are a lot lower. Now the guardians here have a Dremel and want to use the Dremel. So what I would do is, first of all, before we do this, I would get him used to it. I'd give him a piece of kibble and then hold his digit. Give him another piece of kibble. Let's actually do it here. So let's not talk about it. Let's demonstrate it, right? There you go. Yes. Oh, yes. Everybody. This treat's right here. Got a whole bunch of treats for you. So I put the treat in his mouth. Well, let's try to put that in the mouth. And then I hold his digit while he's preoccupied. And I do that for all of his digits. Sometimes this is a good idea to do with the kibble. Kibble works great here at home. It won't work in puppy class. Coming through all the way. Oh, you want to chew on my shoelaces. So um, the idea is getting him used to us playing it. So you give him a treat and flip up his ear. Give him a treat and flip up. It's harder when he's eating stuff. Flip up his gums. Uh, flip up, uh, give him a treat and look under his tail, his anus. And so this way he gets a positive association with all those things. He doesn't have a problem with the vet want to do that, wants to do that later. Um, now for Dremel, what you do is, again, you give him the treat and then hold the digit up. And then give him another treat. And so this is why you want to do a kibble because you're going to give him a whole bunch. You're not Dremel again. All you're doing is every time they touch my digit, I get a treat or a piece of kibble. So once you get to the point where he doesn't really have any, yes, you are definitely tired. Um, once you get to the point where he doesn't have uh, where any sense, of, any pulling back or no problem with you holding his digits, then I would turn that, yes. Then what I would do is give him a piece of kibble and turn the Dremel on while it's in his mouth. So the Dremel's only be on for about a second. So kibble, Dremel on, he gets done chewing, Dremel off. And do that a number of times until he's pretty happy. Uh, when every time he hears that, it's kind of this classical conditioning we went through with priming the clicker. So that's the next stage. The last stage is we actually, well actually second to last stage, sorry buddy, um, is I take the Dremel with it off, give him a piece of kibble, and touch a nail. Then give him a piece of kibble, touch the next nail. So we're doing this off. So what we're doing, and this is really what I do for a living, is I break activities down into small, boy that hurts, um, into small little bite-sized pieces and help the dog practice the first step over and over again until they're ready, uh, they know it, then I go to the next step. And I practice that one over and over again until I know it, then I go to the last step. Boy, you are, you're a little, yes, oh yes. Growling, um, I think I mentioned this earlier, but never correct him for growling. Uh, some of pities especially like to get really growling. And I don't like restraining very much because that creates a frustration. But for going back to the Dremel, the last stage is to actually turn the Dremel on, give him a piece of kibble, and just go for one second on each digit. And then eventually you do it for about two. For Dremel, you really don't want to uh, have it on the nail for longer than about three seconds. It'll actually start burning and that can hurt. And if it's a negative association or you go into the quick, that can cause him to really not like doing this. So he is definitely getting rambunctious. This is a perfect illustration of a dog that is overly tired and needs a nap. So when he gets like this, I'm kind of holding his gums in his mouth so he's not biting on me quite so much. And I don't like restraining him. So this would be where you just get up and leave. And there's a bunch of great toys in there. If he protests and you come back while he's protesting, he thinks the protesting is what it came back for, what, what caused you to come back. So never uh, give in when he is, or never come to him when he's crying or whimpering or barking because that's going to confuse him. Now, if I'm holding a dog and he's, and he's wiggling and struggling, and I do this on purpose, so if I let him down while he's doing this, he thinks that his wiggling and protesting is what allowed him to get down. So I'm making sure he's safe, and when he stops wiggling, I don't want him to pull away. This is about the only time I would not let a dog go, because then he thinks my protesting is what let me go. So he's kind of more relaxed. And we redirected him in, uh, in, uh, in Incidentally, towards something else. Yep, let's not do that. So again, put my finger in the corner of his mouth, remove it, and then tease him with something that he's going to want to have, and then throw it away. So he's going to go, <laughs> you're supposed to go over there and get that at that point, you little rascal. All right, yes. 
And for him, because he hasn't been doing this up until now, I would interpret maybe a little bit of his growliness as kind of his indication that he's grumpy and he needs to go to bed. And don't let him chew on your, lick on your nails like this. Even if he's not biting hard, it's gonna be hard for him to understand. I've read case studies about a pit bull that came up and just nudged somebody with their nose. They thought it was an aggressive dog that kicked the dog and then the dog bit him. And so we want him to understand that he can't do that. Anything he does with you, he thinks he can do with any pet. <laughs> All right. Well, this little firecracker is 11. Yes, and you're all cranky now, but hey, boy, is he cute. And these are some tips and tricks you can use, a medley of tricks, of tricks and uh, tips that you can help uh, to raise a puppy.